here in this committee that we swear all of our witnesses in. So we please rise. Raise your right hand. Agree to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. If so, answer in affirmative. Yeah. Please let the record reflect that all the witnesses answered in affirmative. We're delighted to have with us Mr. Charles Calamiris. Mr. Calamiris is the Henry Kaufman Professor of Financial Institutions at Columbia Business School. And Professor Calamiris co-directs the project on financial deregulation at the American Enterprise Institute and is the Arthur Burns Scholar in International Economics at AEI. Mr. Kling, Mr. Kling Arnold Kling, Mr. Kling is a former senior economist at Freddie Mac from 1986 to 1997. He also served as an economist at the Federal Reserve Board. He is currently an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute. Welcome. Mr. Pinto served as the former chief credit officer of Fannie Mae from 1987 until 1989. He also was the head of the marketing and product management at Fannie Mae for three years. Since leaving the company in 1989, he has worked as a real estate financial services consultant. Welcome. Mr. Thomas Stanton. Mr. Stanton is a fellow of the Center for the Study of American Government at John Hopkins University. He is also a fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration. Uh, Welcome to the committee. And we will begin with you, Mr. Why don't we just go right down the line, of course, and just I'm in right yeah, I did that already. Oh, yeah. yeah, Mr. Pinto, we'll go right down the line. elsewhere. There we go. In my prepared testimony, I show that there are a total of 25 million subprime and alt -A loans outstanding in the United States with an unpaid principal balance of $4.5 trillion. These 25 million default prone loans constitute 44 percent of all mortgage loans by count in the United States. This is the largest percentage that has ever happened in our history. These loans are the source, although not the exclusive source, of the financial crisis that we face today. And they are currently defaulting at unprecedented rates. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac played multiple roles that have, in what has come to be known as the subprime lending crisis. They loosened credit standards for mortgages, which encouraged and extended the housing bubble. They trapped millions of people into loans they knew were unsustainable, and they destroyed the equity savings of tens of millions of homeowners spread throughout every congressional district in the United States. They accomplished this while being permitted to operate at a 75 to 1 leverage ratio that makes Lehman Brothers look like they were operating conservatively. Relative to some earlier testimony, I detail the risks posed by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's portfolios in attachment number four to my submitted testimony. While Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac may deny it, there can be no doubt that they now own or guarantee $1.6 trillion in subprime, Alt-A, and other default loan prone loans and securities. These comprise over one-third of their risk portfolio, not the 15 percent that they keep referring to during earlier testimony. 
They were responsible for 34 percent of all the subprime loans made in the United States, 59 percent of all the Alt-A loans made in the United States. They were not bit players in this play. These 10.5 million non-prime loans are experiencing a default rate that's eight times the level of their 20 million traditional quality loans. These 10.5 million loans include 5.7 million subprime, 3.3 million Alt-A, and 1.5 million loans with other high-risk characteristics. This 10.5 million total does not include FHA's obligations, which add another 3 million to the total and bring it to 13.5 million out of the 25 million subprime and other default-prone loans. That's more than half. According to U.S. bank regulators, subprime loans are generally those with FICO scores below 660. An Alt-A or Liar loan was the favorite of the real estate speculator. I estimate that one million of the GSE's Alt-A loans had no down payment. The purchase of Alt-A loans was justified because they helped meet affordable housing goals. And contrary again to some earlier testimony, I believe that the, uh, affordable the alt A loans were particularly goal rich because about 20 percent of them were made to investors, namely that meant the properties were rental properties. So the fact that they were done as a no income, no asset was irrelevant. The location based on zip code would put them into affordable housing categories and they would get, I believe they would get credit for that. As a result, GSE's default rates are now skyrocketing. Although they, although, they, ah, excuse me, although they are too new to predict default rates with any certainty, I would expect that those portions of Fannie Mae and Freddie's Max 2005 to 2007 books comprising of subprime and other default prone loans to experience default rates ranging from 8 percent for the 2005 originations to over 40 percent for the 2007 originations. I believe there is a chart uh, that is available that shows the uh, performance of their books and you can see from the hockey sticks uh, appearance of the 2007, 2006 and 2005 books uh, what is happening. One of the reasons that subprime, as it is traditionally called, has gotten more publicity is those loans are older. These loans are going bad at in incredible percentages, but they are younger, so they still have a longer ways to go. The losses likely to be suffered by Fannie and Freddie will be a terrible burden to the U.S. taxpayers. If the default rates I predict actually occur, the U.S. taxpayers will have to stand behind hundreds of billions of dollars of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac losses. This could have been averted. They could have exercised leadership and they had done that twice before, once in the mid-1980s and once in the early 1990s. And they could have stopped the mortgage madness that was developing in the industry. Instead, Fannie and Freddie, their response was to open the floodgates. And in the years 2005 to 2007, they bought over $1 trillion of these junk loans that are still on their books. Their purchases were a major factor in the development of the housing bubble and then a huge number of defaulted mortgages which are now causing massive declines in house prices. Without Fannie and Freddie's actions, we would not have this unprecedented housing crisis. A few more observations about Fannie and Freddie turning the American dream of home ownership into the American nightmare of foreclosure. They followed an origination model initially established by FHA. It enabled thinly capitalized mortgage bankers and bro mortgage brokers to take over virtually the entire origination market. These bro mortgage brokers and mortgage bankers were able to compete for mortgage originations with thousands of well capitalized community banks, banks that are conspicuously absent from the epidemic of default prone loan problems nationwide. In late 2004, Richard Siren and Frank Raines both went to the meetings of the originator community and made clear that they were going to wrest back the subprime and alt-a mortgage market from Wall Street. Siren said, our success in the future depends on our ability to serve emerging markets and they become the surging markets. Raines also said, we have to push products and opportunities to people who have lesser credit quality. These statements alerted the uh, originator community that if they could make subprime and alt-a loans, there was a ready market for them, and this stimulated an orgy of junk mortgage development. 
Fannie and Freddie used their automated underwriting systems to divert subprime and Alte loans from private label securitizers, driving up the value of these loans and making mortgage brokers even more eager to find bar borrowers regardless of their credit standing. Why did Fannie and Freddie do this? First, they were trying to meet HUD's affordable housing goals, which by 2005 required 55 percent of all their loans that they purchased be affordable housing loans, including 28 percent to low-income and very low-income borrowers. Second, after their accounting scandals of 2003-2004, they were afraid of new and stricter regulation. By ramping up their affordable housing lending, that trillion dollars I mentioned earlier, they showed their supporters in Congress that they could be a major source on a continuing basis of affordable housing financing. Mr. Chairman, there is much more in my prepared testimony, including my recommendations on how to meet this challenge, but that is the end of my oral statement. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Pinto. Uh, Mr. Kleen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the committee. Uh, I would like my written testimony to be I would like my written testimony to be entered as if I had spoken it. Without objection. Thank you. It is a privilege to be asked to testify in this forum today regarding the collapse of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and the ongoing financial crisis. My name is Arnold Kling. My training is in economics, and in the late 1980s and early 1990s, I worked at Freddie Mac, where I was present at the creation of several quantitative risk management tools that paved the way for innovations in mortgage finance. Speaking as a former financial engineer, I have many regrets about the role played by modern financial methods in this crisis. Rather than speak defensively about financial innovation, I want to offer constructive suggestions for public policy going forward. I emphatically disagree with the extreme partisan narratives for this crisis. To blame the Community Reinvestment Act for what happened is wrong. To blame financial deregulation for what happened is wrong. The narrative I present in my written testimony describes a combination of government failure and market failure. I want to focus on how both industry executives and regulators were fooled about the risks in the system. In particular, perverse incentives in ca bank capital requirements encouraged unsound lending practices and promoted excessive securitization. When a bank originates a low-risk mortgage, why would the bank pay Freddie Mac a fee to guarantee that mortgage against default? Freddie Mac has no intrinsic comparative advantage in bearing that credit risk. However, in practice, the bank was able to reduce its capital requirements by exchanging its loans for securities. For bearing the exact same credit risk, Freddie Mac was allowed by its regulator to hold less capital than the bank. By requiring Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae to hold less capital than banks, our regulatory system encouraged Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae to grow at the expense of traditional depository institutions. That turned out to be dangerous. The perverse regulatory incentives were even more striking with high-risk loans. If a bank originates a high-risk loan, you would think that there is no way to avoid high capital requirements. But it turns out that when a high-risk loan has been laundered by Wall Street, it can come back into the banking system in the form of a AAA-rated security tranche. And I should mention that you had the people here. I know this committee has discussed the problems with the rating agencies and that the ratings were bogus. You had the people here this morning who were in a position to call them out on it. They could have run these securities, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae could have run these securities through their stress tests, reported that these loans, that these securities were going to blow up and put a stop to the private label subprime market right then and there. They had the power to do that. But from once they were laundered as AAA tranches, from the standpoint of capital requirements, bank regulators close their eyes and pretend that the risk has disappeared. My reading of the history of the secondary mortgage market suggests the following lessons. One, capital requirements matter. 
Details that are easily overlooked by regulators can turn out to cause major distortions. Two, securitization is not necessary for mortgage lending. On a level regulatory playing field, traditional mortgage lending by depository institutions probably would prevail over securitized lending. Rather than try to revive Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, I would recommend that Congress encourage a mortgage lending system based on 30-year mortgages originated and held by old-fashioned banks and savings and loans. This would require instructing the regulators of Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, banks and savings and loans to all use the same capital standard for mortgages, one that is based on a stress test methodology. Three, subsidized mortgage credit is an inefficient tool for promoting home ownership. Unless what you want is home buyers who are buried in debt and speculating on house price appreciation, I recommend that Congress not try to create cheap mortgages, but instead use other means to encourage home ownership. For recent financial innovations, particularly credit default swaps, have changed our financial system in ways that current policymakers fail to recognize. <coughs> Bailouts and rescues are counterproductive in today's financial crisis. Within the financial sector, deleveraging needs to slow down and the process of shutting down failed institutions needs to speed up. Relative to these necessities, handouts from the taxpayers are a hindrance, not a help. Thank you very much. Uh Mr. Kling. Mr. Calamaris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is an honor and a pleasure to appear before you and the Committee today to share my views on the role of the GSEs in the current financial crisis and the lessons for GSE reform going forward. I would like to ask that my written testimony and two background articles, which provide more detailed analysis in support of my statement, also be entered into the record. And, Mr. Chairman, before I begin, I would also like to correct a typographical error in one of those background documents, the one authored by myself and Peter Wallison. Um, and I, I think I can just do it orally. Um, in that document on page 8 in the second column, there are two sentences that need to be replaced. They read as follows. Uh, in addition, Freddie Mac's disclosures indicate that of the loans added to its portfolio of single-family loans between 2005 and 2007, 97 percent were interest-only mortgages, 85 percent were Alt-A, 72 percent were negative amortization loans, 67 percent had FICO scores less than 620, and 68 percent had original loan-to-value ratios greater than 90 percent. There were typos in that, in that two-sentence excerpt. And that needs to be replaced with the following. Yeah, well, let me just say that um, based on that, let me just read this and you can sort of maybe respond to it as you uh, give your presentation, uh, Mr. Calamaris. Uh, the committee has received a letter from a former Fannie Mae executive, uh, Mr. Barry Ziggis. Mr. Ziggis disputes the way you interpret Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's financial data in a recent article you published with Mr. Peter Wallison of the American Enterprise Institute, so you can respond. Since the, this article is now part of our hearing record, I am going to ask unanimous consent to submit Mr. Zygas' uh, letter in the hearing record and ask that you respond to it for the record, so you can do that as you move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Actually, it was uh, through the kindness, I guess, of, of, of the chairman who showed me that letter. Uh, earlier, or had it had it sent to me, that I looked uh, at the uh, the article and recognized these typographical errors. So this correction actually responds and completely corrects the article and deals with all of those uh, things that that gentleman found. And I appreciate his pointing them out to me. So thank the you very much. So is, therefore, I'll give you an extra minute, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. In your, in your testimony, we give you an extra minute. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Sure. I, I might. Ask from a parliamentary standpoint, wouldn't it be in our best interest as the unanimous consent that we enclose that, that the two be placed next to each other in the record so that there not be a chance that this oral testimony would somehow not be exactly next to the written? Because I, I'd like the record to be With accurate as to the original and perhaps. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now I'll read the uh, replacement text. Tables 1 and 2 show that, comma, 
for each category of mortgages with subprime characteristics, comma, most of the portfolio of loans with those characteristics were acquired from 2005 to 2007. For example, 83.8 percent of Fannie's and 90 percent of Freddie's interest-only loans as of September 2008 were acquired from 2005 to 2007. And 57.5 percent of Fannie's and 61 percent of Freddie's loans with FICO scores of less than 620 as of September 2008 were acquired from 2005 to 2007. That completes the correction, Mr. Chairman. None of the uh, rest of the article requires any correction. Um, this apparently, I, I had not seen the final edits on this article. Apparently someone was confused and made some word changes that didn't make sense. And I apologize for that. I also have to apologize to Mr. Garrett because as I was listening to his questions, I think uh, earlier, I think he actually was relying on that exact paragraph. And so my apologies to the committee for that mistake. Uh, given the time constraint of my oral testimony, uh, I'll summarize my written testimony by posing and answering a short list of questions. Did Fannie and Freddie play an important role in the subprime crisis? Yes. As Ed Pinto has shown, they ended up holding about $1.6 trillion, or roughly half of the total non-FHA exposure on subprime losses. And through their role as standard setters in the industry, they played a leading role in relaxing underwriting standards and promoting no-docs lending. Was their involvement in subprime simply bad luck, or did it reflect purposeful willingness to undertake risks that they recognized as dangerous and that they recognized were arguably not in the interest of subprime borrowers? Yes. They were experienced in this area, they knew the dangers of no-docs lending, and they did it anyway. Their risk managers saw the losses coming. The risk managers also saw the potential human costs of no-docs lending coming and warned senior management about it in advance. Was the GSE's willingness to undertake these uniquely large risk exposures through relaxed underwriting standards on sub subprime loans related to their GSE status and their affordable housing mandate? Yes. The GSE charters and the political deal between the GSEs and the government, which was understood in the marketplace, was that there was a clear quid pro quo connecting the implicit government guarantee of GSEs' debts and other favorable treatment of GSEs with the GSEs' willingness to expand their funding of affordable housing, and subprime and Alt-A was the means they chose to do it. And as the internal emails of Freddie Mac clearly show, although management recognized the dangers of subprime losses, because of the crucial need to preserve government support, at least in their minds, affordable housing goals, quote, tipped the balance, end quote, in 2004 in deciding to relax underwriting standards. Would the subprime crisis have been different if the GSEs had not decided to enter subprime and Alt-A lending so aggressively in 2004? Yes. The GSEs were the dominant players in the mortgage market and also played crucial roles as standard setters. They recognized their, quote, market making, end quote, role and knew that in the past their decision to discontinue no docs lending had led to the disappearance of the product in the market. Furthermore, the timing of entry by the GSEs was important. They came into the subprime and Alt-A market as it was ramping up in 2004, and their entry was associated with a rapid escalation of lending in 2004 and 2005. Lending nearly tripled, subprime lending nearly tripled in Alt-A from 2003 to 2005. Finally, unlike some other market participants, they continued to buy long after clear signs of trouble had emerged in mid-2006 in the housing market, which meant that their market-making role grew over time, particularly so in late 2006 and 2007, when origination volumes remained very high despite the impending problems that were already visible in the housing market. Dr. Kalamos, could you summarize? Yes. I'm, I'm, well, I conclude that counterfactually the crisis would have been less than half as large as the actual crisis if the GSEs had stuck to their traditional roles as prime lenders. I would also note that the reason people like me didn't complain about this in 2005 and 2006 was that they had adopted accounting practices that masked these by the way they defined subprime and Alt-A lending. Finally, my, my last comment is it is worthwhile to promote home ownership in the U.S. This should be done, in my view, 
not through the GSEs. Those, their assets, their charters should be fully and credibly privatized. It should be done by the government on budget in a transparent manner befitting our democracy and through direct subsidies like down payment assistance rather than in a way that encourages borrowers and lenders to increase leverage imprudently and therefore promote unwarranted foreclosure risk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Calamaris. Mr. Stanton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would ask, please, that my written statement and two attachments be included for their record. Without objection. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Issa, members of the Distinguished Committee, uh, in 1991 I wrote a book called A State of Risk, Will Government-Sponsored Enterprises Be the Next Financial Crisis? And then worked with uh, a small group of reformers, including Congressman Jake Pickle of the House Ways and Means Committee, Democrat of Texas, and Representative Bill Gratison of Ohio, a Republican. Um, we tried to improve Federal regulation of, of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and their safety and soundness, but because of very strong lobbying by those two organizations, the regulator was created without adequate authority. In my testimony today, I would like to make three basic points. One, while Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac did not cause the mortgage credit debacle, they did engage in risky practices that turned them into sources of vulnerability rather than strength for the mortgage market and the larger economy. Two, as it becomes clear that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac in fact are insolvent, it would help to place them into receivership and thereby remove private shareholders from the two failed companies. Once shareholders are clearly gone, the next administration can use the two companies to provide much needed support and reform, including consumer protections, for the home mortgage market. If the companies remain in conservatorship rather than receivership, then government will face conflicting objectives about the role of the two companies in serving urgent public purposes versus serving financial interests of the companies and their shareholders. Three, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac should not be restored to their previous status as privately owned organizations that operate with pervasive Federal backing. The two companies and their powerful constituencies have consistently fought for higher leverage and against effective accountability. Even if a strong regulator were created initially, and somebody mentioned the concept of public utility regulation, the political power of the two companies can be expected to weaken accountability over time and restore the companies to their dominant market positions, high leverage, and financial vulnerability. Let me briefly talk about the first point and leave the rest for discussion. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac committed serious misjudgments that helped to bring about their insolvency. The most serious of these misjudgments involved the company's resistance to accepting more effective supervision and capital standards. For years, the two companies exerted, exerted their influence to fend off capital standards that would have reduced their excessive leverage and absorbed potential losses. The two companies compounded the problem by taking on excessive risk just at the point that housing prices were peaking. Among other losing assets, the two companies held over $200 billion of private label mortgage-related securities backed by Alt-A or subprime mortgages in 2007. In making these mistakes, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac revealed the inherent vulnerabilities of the government-sponsored enterprise, or GSE, as an organizational model. First, the GSE can live or die according to its charter and other laws that determine the condition under which it operates. That means GSEs select their chief officers in good part based on ability to manage political risk, as we saw in the first panel today, rather than on their ability to manage two of the largest financial institutions in the world. Second, GSEs combine private ownership with government backing in a way that creates a virtually unstoppable political force. Because of their government backing and low capital requirements, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac gained immense market power. They doubled in size every five years or so until this year the two companies funded over $5 trillion of mortgages, about 40 percent of the mortgage market. Their market power gave them political power, which is seen in the fact that the new regulator created by the Housing and Economic Recovery Act of 2008, enacted late July just before the companies collapsed, 
still fail to give the new regulator the full mandate, authority, or discretion over safety and soundness and systemic risk that is available to the Federal Bank regulators. And if there's a question on this, I'd be delighted to submit documentation to the record. In short, the mix of private incentives and government backing created a dynamic that led not only to the hubris that brought about the meltdown of internal controls of both Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac several years ago, but also their insolvency in 2008. But Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac by themselves did not cause the housing bubble or the proliferation of subprime and other mortgages that borrowers could not afford to repay. In analyzing the two companies, I discovered a phenomenon that can be called Stanton's Law. Risk will migrate to the place where government is least equipped to deal with it. So the capital markets arbitraged across regulatory requirements and ultimately sent trillions of dollars of mortgages to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, where capital requirements were low and federal supervision was weak. But the capital, the capital markets also found other places where government could not manage the risk and also sent huge volumes of subprime, Alt-A, interest only, and other toxic mortgages to structured investment vehicles of commercial banks, private securitization conduits, and collateralized debt obligations that were virtually unsupervised. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to end on a note about the human costs of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Their actions led to hundreds of thousands of American families and possibly more than a million facing delinquency and default on their mortgages and potential foreclosure of their homes. They funded the overbuilding of hundreds of thousands of homes that will be vacant or boarded up because no one wants to live there. The cost to the American taxpayer will run potentially to hundreds of billions of dollars. All of this harm occurred on the watch of the four men on the first panel. It could have been avoided with prudent lending, prudent capital, and prudent management. So thank you again for holding this important hearing on two financial institutions that use their high leverage and insatiable appetites to grow to an unmanageable size before they failed. I would be pleased to respond to any questions. Let me thank you um, very, very much uh, for your testimony. You know, um, uh, I think it would have been wise for us to allow them to go first and then allow the others to stay and to listen and then respond because I, I really think in terms of the testimony information that they have given us has been very, very, very helpful. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, I totally agree with you. And, and in fact, of all the things that my hope as ranking member and your hope as, as chairman that I'd like to do is to make that reversal whenever possible so that whether it's administration or other government witnesses, we're able to do just that. I think it, you're exactly right. It would have been very helpful today. Right. Thank you very much for your comment. Um, let me move right along. Um, uh, I would like to ask, I guess, let me start with you, uh, Mr. Stanton, being you just, um, and of course the others to respond. In your testimony, of course, um, uh, uh, we talked about, I'd like to ask, I guess, the panel about the affordable housing goal uh, that the Department of Housing and Urban Development set for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Um, and Mr. Stanton, in your testimony, I think it was page five and six, I think it was, you explained that when Congress rechartered Fannie and Freddie in 1992, we asked them to devote some of their time and resources to finding ways to help low and moderate income Americans buy homes. But you said that these goals did not lead Fannie and Freddie to invest in risky mortgages. Can you explain to us your conclusion and how you arrived at that? Yes, sir. I'd be delighted. Um, if you look carefully at the law, and I'm a student of the charters of the two companies and the legal framework surrounding them, you find that they are required to undertake activities, and I'll quote, relating to mortgages on housing for low and moderate income families involving a reasonable economic return that may be less than the return earned on other activities, close quote. In other words, the law does not require them, they don't receive appropriations, to take losses 
on the affordable housing loans they make. And if you follow that through to the 1992 Act and it follows through to 2008, what you see is that the Department of Housing and Urban Development is not allowed to impose goals that would cause the companies to fall below that standard. So in fact, when you look, uh, two things were probably going on. One, it, it's a more subtle point. These are political companies. Their leaders are retained to manage political risk. So that means they will engage in affordable housing beyond HUD in order to get favors for other parts of their charter, either to block things they don't want or to gain things they do want. And of course, they also had insatiable appetites. When you buy $200 billion of AAA rated mortgage securities backed by Alt A and subprime mortgages, and you don't ask your own risk analysts to run those mortgages through the filter in order to do due diligence and check on the rating agencies, you're asking for trouble. But you're not doing that to support the affordable housing market. You're doing that because you expect that there are good returns on those investments. All right. The other members of the panel agree on that? I have a little different uh, take on that. Uh, when the original goals were set subsequent to the uh, 1992 legislation. I believe HUD set them in 93. And they were set a little bit purposefully low because they didn't quite know what was going to happen. And Fannie and Freddie sort of jumped over the hurdles very quickly. And that created a backlash uh, that said, wait a minute, HUD, you set them too low. And HUD learned from that. And year after year, they kept ratcheting them up and ratcheting them up. Uh, Fannie and Freddie had to keep, they, they, remember, this is a duopoly. They're competing against each other for the same loans. They're also competing with FHA for the same loans. They're all considered goal rich. Ultimately, they were competing with subprime for the same loans. They were considered goal rich. And their regulator has called all of these loans goal rich. By the early uh, part of this decade, you had situations where at the end of the year, if they were a little bit short, a bidding war would break out. In fact, Fannie rented some loans for a while. That was a scandal that uh, developed five or six years ago where they rented some loans and then returned them later the next year to, in order to meet their goals. Uh, so these, the pressures that were put on them were tremendous. But I would point out that I believe in the 2007 uh, Freddie Mac uh, document, they concluded that the lowest 10 percent of their business was put on the books at a zero return on equity. That does not meet the standard that was in the charter a zero return on equity, and that was calculated optimistically. It turns out, if you were to do that calculation today, these loans were put on the books at tremendous losses. Yeah, yes, uh, Dr. Calamiris. I, I just want to add that um, I think that there were obviously other motivations, too, for getting involved in subprime, and the, the email correspondence that uh, I saw uh, from Freddie Mac indicated that. But I think what was interesting is that in all those emails it was also reflected that affordable housing goals and this political uh, sort of strategy that Mr. Stanton referred to were part of the mix and that one of the emails specifically said tipped the balance uh, when they were considering whether to get into the no docs area and Alta and subprime more broadly. So I, I think it's important to, to mention both that there are multiple influences. These, let's face it, there were a lot of managers who weren't GSEs who were pursuing this too, based on short-term profits for themselves at the expense of their stockholders. I would say that the, the executives of the GSEs were guilty of that as well. But that it is, I think, pretty clear from the emails that the affordable housing mandate and their, let's say, political manipulation of that uh, was definitely part of the story. Right. Thank you. We, we, and something, Mr. Chairman. Sure. These are two companies funding five trillion dollars in mortgages. The whole point of trying to underwrite mortgages for people that are non-traditional borrowers is to do it carefully and really work at it, so that you try to, in fact, make people eligible for mortgages because the normal FICO score, for example, is based on traditional borrowers, not on affordable housing borrowers, and that isn't what they did. They simply plunged in and bought huge volumes of mortgages without regard to the welfare of the people that they could have underwritten more carefully. So that's part of the problem, too. Right. Thank you very much. I yield. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
uh, this is a wonderful panel, and I appreciate your statements. And uh, uh, obviously, we'll be pouring over them well into the next Congress. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I'm almost befuddled to try to come up with how, how many questions we could ask. But let me start with Mr. Pinto. The earlier panel, uh, which I would have liked you first, but I'm also glad you're after, seemed to want to make a distinction between Alt A and subprime. And even when we started asking about it, we got told, well, some of the Alt A's are subprime and some are the other. From a standpoint of deviating from sound practices that lead to reasonable default rates, is there any real difference? No. Alt A actually stood, one of the meanings of it was Alt Agency. They were things that the agencies would not buy. How do I know that? Because in 1985, uh, I was one of the authors of Fannie Mae's revised underwriting requirements. And in that revised underwriting statement, we said we were not going to do the kinds of loans that ended up being high risk, too high risk for Fannie Mae to undertake, investor loans. Uh, two to four, or particularly three and four units, uh, excess loans on condos. Uh, there were many different types, uh, low start rates on arms, NEGAM arms. We called them JIP arms, uh, graduated payment arms. There were all kinds of loans, and those were the loans that became known as Alt A. I was happy to hear uh, uh, CEO Raines say earlier that Fannie actually remembered what had happened in the early 80s, in the mid 80s, and it happened in the late 80s when the Alt A business, when the uh, no doc, low doc business blew up, um, that they remembered that, but they did not learn. Starting in the uh, early 1990s, they came back with a 97 percent uh, mortgage, which they had no basis for figuring out what the risks were. Freddie Mac, I put it in the record, uh, had showed on 95 percent loans. The default rates on those things were sky high. They just about go off the chart. Yet they were doing 97 percent loans on the basis of, of no data. And that was the beginning of this process. So the Alt-A loans, um, the subprime loans, I lumped them all together. How did I end up coming up with $1.6 trillion? It's very simple. If you look at the kinds of risks, again, uh, Frank Raines referred to them as what we learned in the uh, 80s and early 90s. If you look at the kind of risks that they entered into on those $1.6 trillion, they knew those were risky loans. They performed under stress the same way. They all have incredibly high default rates and they are performing that way exactly today. So every category I have put on my chart ends up being in that same bucket. I appreciate that. And Mr. Calamaris, I see you are shaking your head yes. So I think we have established today that we are not going to find the difference in spite of the distinction being made by the earlier panel. I, I would ask two things. First of all, would all of you be willing to answer some additional questions for the record? Because I know I am running out of time and I very much would like to get them into the record. With that, I would like to uh, ask a couple of questions that are not likely to be asked normally and I think the public has a right to, to understand. The vast majority of states, including my own, California, have no recourse loans, meaning that no matter how much funding somebody has in their personal pocket, including that earlier testified roughly 20 percent who were speculators. They are able to get a, a no money down, no stated income loan, and they are able to never occupy that home, perhaps hold it for rental or perhaps just hold it to flip. At, the, at, at one of the points in this whole debacle, the turning back in or the failure to pay, or in some cases, we have had it in California, people bought homes, rented them out, never made the payments and waited for the foreclosure. They were guaranteed if they put nothing down and rented them out that they were going to make money because they collected rent and paid nothing out. And, and Mr. Stanton, I know you are smiling, but you know, as you see these, you begin to realize not everyone is a victim that in fact took out a loan. Should we in the, on this dais look at a recourse structure to government-backed, government-guaranteed, government-underwritten loans so as to take the speculator who does have other assets out of the equation of taking this heads I win, tails the government lose situation? Mr. Stanton, you were shaking your head earlier. Uh, would you agree that, that that could be a tool that we would have a right to do since we the people, we the representatives of people, are paying out 
potentially trillions of dollars, and in some cases the money is because of speculators who kept their money and, in fact, left us holding the bag. Absolutely. And that, that's the logic that led me to recommend these companies be removed from conservatorship now that they have an apparent negative value, put in receivership, and used essentially as government corporations. It was stunning to hear these CEOs say, gee, it would have been nice to have consumer protections. Um, in fact, as a government corporation, without worrying about shareholders, th there would be a way then to impose risk sharing requirements on all the participants up and down the line to structure much more sound ways of doing business and to add, if I can um, make a plug for a colleague, Alex Pollack of the American Enterprise Institute, basic consumer protections. He has a one-page mortgage form. And one of the questions on the one-page mortgage form is, what is the highest monthly payment that this mortgage could ever go to? Well, that's a really simple question that reveals what happens when you've got these teaser rates because a whole bunch of those mortgages, the answer might have been infinity. There are no natural limits. So as a government corporation, we could use both Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to do the kind of risk sharing you're talking about, impose serious consumer protections, and create serious standards for the market going forward. Thank you, Congress, Mr. Congressman Kong. Isa, um, I hope that you will keep raising the issue of investor loans and non-owner occupied loans because your colleagues often seem to forget and they talk about foreclosure moratoriums and workouts being a solution for this. But nobody has told me what the percentage of non-owner occupied loans is. We know that 15 percent of the loans made in 2005 and 2006 were non-owner occupied. Um, and I would just step back and saying, rather than make those recourse loans, ask why are they eligible for any government guarantee at all? If your goal is to promote home ownership, I, don't, I assume you are not trying to promote home speculating, so why are they eligible for Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, or any government guarantee at all? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I think with that we will uh, we'll probably realize that home ownership and being a homeowner and renting out to others is not quite the same thing, and, and I appreciate it. Homes ownership, yes, as the chairman said. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Congressman Bill Brafe, California. Thank you very much. And let me, let me thank the panel um, and uh, Mr. Kling. Thank you for throwing darts at both sides. That is kind of refreshing in this town. Um, the, there is a whole lot of things I would love to jump right into, but when we get into this, this issue of unsecured, basically um, finding ways to be able to qualify people at any cost. I don't know if you guys are aware of it, and um, you know the, the ranking member will say, that, uh, will remember this, in 05 in San Diego there was a big deal about the fact that you not only didn't have to be a U.S. citizen, you did not only um, not have to be legally in the country, you didn't even have to show a a viable uh, ID that you were who you said you were to get a loan. And many of those loans were through nonprofits that were getting grants from the federal government. So this is sort of the, how deep we got into this issue that, um, and it wasn't just the, the nonprofits, but it was the for-profits were searching out anybody and everybody that we can figure out how to get them to sign up on this program because they, they were basically, seems like you create the paper and you had all this forward investment and love to buy it sight unseen. But I mean to the point of where somebody wasn't even required to prove that they were whoever the name was on the loan. Didn't even have to show a United States viable ID. They were using uh, uh, consulate cards from, from another country. That, that is issued about, based on the honor system. I only raise this to show you how far this goes, and I'll be very interested to see: Do we require legal status, um, uh, viable identification under the Real ID Bill to participate in the bailout that's going on now, or the re, the refinancing and everything else? I don't hear anything about that. It's just like, well, everybody and anybody who can get into the system, the more the merrier. Um, you brought up the the credit default issue. Uh, the swaps. And I know that is not specific to here. But from the testimony we have seen, this is a huge 
acts hanging over our head right now. Anybody knows where it is? How many trillion? Anybody got any idea how many trillions of dollars are? What's the number that is floating around now with with credit Six, default swaps? Sixty-two trillion or something. How much? Sixty trillion outstanding is the end of last year gross. Sixty. Trillion. Sixty trillion. And it came from nothing ten years ago. Yeah, which was really a product of our regulatory reforms squeezed off one side and left a wide open and the bulge started coming out there. And Mr. Chairman, I think that's one of the things um, the new Congress has really got to look at it. Here comes sixty trillion. You know, think about that is the, the culture shock we've had with the one point three we've issued since March, but sixty trillion hanging out there and basically um, Vegas um, could you give better odds? I mean, it's a lot of gambling out there. So, I want to just in this hearing point out we have this huge, huge threat out there that nobody's really talking about because kind of responding to the problems of the past and not seeing this come down the pike. Um, guys, any any comments about that? Because you've been frank and open about it, and I think that it's important that the ranking, um, hopefully, the future chairman and ranking member of this committee is here to hear it. Uh, yes, I'd just like to say something briefly about that. On an optimistic note, remember that um, credit default swaps are a zero net sum game. So whether, even if there are $60 trillion in nominal exposure, the aggregate exposure in the financial system is always zero. Now, there is a problem, of course, and we saw that with AIG and its credit default swap position vis-a-vis -vis Goldman Sachs. And that, that problem is that if somebody is on the brink of failing and they aren't properly collateralized in their positions, which was the case for AIG because it had AAA status. It was not the case for Lehman Brothers, by the way, because it didn't have AAA status. So we did have a problem with uh, AIG because of its AAA status and its lack of collateralization. And so it could have added significantly tens of billions, maybe more, to the cost of a cleanup. But more generally, the problem isn't nearly as bad as, as the sort of headline numbers are indicating. And it was very particularly a problem for AIG precisely because of AIG's AAA status. And that was demonstrated by Lehman Brothers when they unwound. There was, I believe, it was a nothing. Right. Uh, it all happened and everybody yawned. And the reason was exactly uh, what Charlie just said. And they had a, a lot outstanding. Uh, in my written testimony, I spell out what I think are the problems with credit default swaps. I don't think we in the economics and finance profession fully grasp the magnitude of what's going on and the implications of what's going on there. And I think that it's quite possible that a lot of the panic deleveraging that's going on and the str very strange relationships in security prices that we're seeing today, I strongly suspect that that has a lot to do with the way the credit default swap ma market operates. I, I, I think the issue of credit default swaps has been covered, but I want to point out something else on the horizon that is worth looking at, particularly since Charles was so optimistic. I can be a bit pessimistic. Um, we have seen a huge number of defaults now because of bad mortgages, mortgages that never should have been issued in the first place, subprime, alt A, whatever we want to call them. What we have not seen yet is the full impact of defaults on homes because the recession hits. And that has been the traditional source of defaults on homes. So we can expect a second wave to be coming in. And again, I reiterate, it is time to take both GSEs in hand as government corporations. Stop this, this incessant, gee, do we price high, do we price low, because we have to satisfy shareholders because it is a conservatorship, not receivership, versus we have got to support the housing market, and start using the GSEs actively to start dealing with what is going to be a much worse problem. Mr. Chairman, I, I just want to say the three of us up here actually are um, sons of areas that were redlined consistently before this. And I think we understand the challenges for the working class neighborhoods because it was our neighborhoods that were redlined by these institutions before and we need to address that. I, I just think that we need to recognize too that a lot of this is that we don't even talk about is that not just home ownership but what was perceived as a minimum home ownership back in the early 70s, I mean the, the late 70s, early 80s, you will remember 
that home ownership, the first step was usually into an attached condominium, something you could afford, build equity, you build your credit rating, you worked into it. What we've seen in the last 10 years is nobody even think about those things. They're going for the four or five bedroom detached house and whatever. And I think that we've got to understand a level of expectation needs to be reflected appropriately, especially for people trying to get out of that work that those neighborhoods that we grew up in um, or to live, buy a home in those neighborhoods. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you. Uh, the gentleman from Ohio, uh, from Idaho, Idaho. <laughs> Congressman <laughs> Sally. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, gentlemen, I'm, I'm uh, sorry that I was uh, gone for a short while while you're giving your testimony. I had looked at some of the information that you provided earlier, and I guess there's there's two pieces to the puzzle uh, as Congress wrestles with what to do going forward. And and the first one is, if you start today and you're going to make a sound loan, how do you do that? And and I think your most of your uh, information goes to that, uh, Mr. Pinto. You you have the chart that you. Uh, uh, talked about, I think, during your presentation, and I'm, I'm looking at the 2007 graph, and it doesn't look very rosy. Um, how, how do those loans are already made? How do we get that bleeding stopped? Uh, because this is this is going to impact uh, this piece is going to if we started making good loans today, this piece will still impact things profoundly. Uh, what should we do to to try and shore that up? Excellent question. In, in my prepared remarks, I, I propose two solutions, a short term and a long term. The short term, and, and I liken it, you are fighting a forest fire. It is very simple. Where do you fight the fire? At the fire line or away from the fire line? You have, if it is out of control, you have to fight it away from the fire line. You have to build a fire break. And I have looked at all the different modification programs that are being proposed, and none of them establish a fire line away from the fire break, away from the line of fire. And as I, I'm, I'm not one who normally espouses that the federal government spent a lot of money for something. However, the issue that we've gotten was just touched on by Mr. Stanton about the second wave that's coming. It's actually a second and a third wave. The second wave is. Fannie and Freddie's book of business is new. The things that have been causing the foreclosures to a large extent in the past that were loans made earlier in this decade. The ones that were made in 05, 06, and 07 are just, you just see it, are just starting to go bad. And the ultimate uh, foreclosure rates are going to be way up here. They're going to be way off the charts. And uh, that's the second wave. The, the third wave is what's known as the real economy the people who actually played by the rules and now they are losing their job or whatever. And I have estimated that by the end of next year with the price declines that everyone is agreeing on, 1 percent a month to the end of next year, that there is going to be $12.2 trillion of mortgage debt outstanding and $11 trillion of home value. That is a national LTV on people, loan to value on people that have homes of 111 percent. That has never happened before, I will say, in the history of the United States. I don't think it has ever happened before in the history of the world. In the Depression, it was 30 percent. So that is what we are looking at. And so the second and third waves are coming. So what do you do? You have to identify, and we can identify these loans. Fannie Mae has got a great little chart. Freddie Mac has got the same chart. Everybody else knows where the New York Fed has all these charts. Everybody knows where all these loans are, the ones that are defaulted and not defaulted. We know what the characteristics of the loans are. We know, I've identified, there are uh, $4.4 trillion of junk loans out there. We have to find a few trillion of those that are owner occupants, and we have to identify them, and we have to put together a program that has the five steps that I listed in my testimony and make an offer to those people to refinance them, but you are going to have to bring down the uh, principal amount substantially so that you create equity and create that cushion. You have to create a strong fire break, but it is also very important that you do not put 50-year loans. I hear them talking about extending the term to 40 and 50 years. That is crazy. You want equity to be building back up, not push it way out. You can't be putting the delinquencies on the back end. That doesn't create uh, an incentive to stay in these homes. We have to create hope for these people to get to continue with these loans and continue with their homes. And the way you do that 
is the proposal that I laid out in my testimony. The second part, which I'll just reference, is we have to deleverage the whole housing system. We have over leveraged the entire system, starting with the homeowner, going to the banks, Fannie Mae, which now has no capital, but they were over leveraged 75 to 1 all along, and then the, the mortgage backed securities, which were over leveraged. We had Congress created a system that over leveraged the, the, everything all the way through. We have to deleverage that. If I'd ask the committee to do anything, is to look at the question of how do you deleverage the financial system in the United States. It used to work when the leverage was 3.7 to 1. We've changed it to 30 to 40 to 1. It is not sustainable. You, you're suggesting that the mortgage lenders are going to have to take the loss of writing down the principal. The mortgage lender, well, the federal government is on the hook for, I hate to tell you this, you already own 77 percent of all the mortgages in the United States, owner on the credit hook for them. Therefore, it comes back to us. Well, we, we spent a half a trillion dollars in deficit in last year's budget. That doesn't count the $700 billion of bailout, the 85 for AIG, the other 35 for AIG, or 35 for Bear Stearns. And, I mean, that list goes on and on and on. And we're, now we're talking about the, the, uh, the automakers. We don't have any money. I, I, what are we going to write down against? Just more deficit spending? Or I, I realize the taxpayers are going to have to be on the hook yeah. for. You already own these loans. You're responsible for them. We, Four point six trillion of the twelve trillion is Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. But, Who owns Fannie Mae and Freddie but Mac? But you're suggesting we can make we can create value out of thin air. Well, and, no, no, I'm not creating value out of thin air. You have to write down these mortgages to a level where the people that are in them, the own, the homeowners, have an incentive for staying there. Putting them through the foreclosure process is slow death. It's, it's letting the fire burn yeah. out of control. Yeah. You're going to have 8 million, 8 million foreclosures if you don't get ahead of this ramp rampaging fire. I'm telling you, there are going to be, in the next four years, 8 million foreclosures. That's out of 57 million loans. that We've already had two or three million foreclosures. Um, that's 8 million more. Uh, I'll, um, I'm going to disagree with that. Um, so, so we've agreed on a lot of stuff so far, but I'm going to disagree. I personally, my instinct is kind of yours that uh, the government, in, my, my concern is that if the government gets involved trying to bail out at the homeowner level, you don't know in Washington which homeowner can follow through with a, with a, mark, with a principal write down, which homeowner cannot. You can't manage that from Washington. The administrative expenses of that are going to be huge. And that's, I think 10 years from now, all you're going to have to show for that is lots of administrative expenses, lots of repeat defaults, and worst of all, a housing market that's still out of balance because people don't know where the prices are, where the prices belong in the housing market. I would say in the end, it'll be cheaper to take those 8 million people, pay for moving trucks, hold the door for them, get them out or turn them into renters than it will be to try to rework the mortgages. That's my prediction. I hope it's not correct because I know that you're going to want to rework the mortgages, but that's my fear. Aren't those same 8 million people going to live in those same houses, though? I mean, they're just going to trade addresses at the end of the day, aren't they? Or, the, or you're not going to build 8 million new apartments for them to live in. Or they will rent their houses. But I think we have to get to a, a natural market with supply and demand in balance. If as long as you try to prop up people in houses that they couldn't, that they really didn't belong in the first place, you, the rest of the market is not going to be cured. That's my fear. My fear is that 10 years from now, we're still going to be arguing how to bail out the housing market because it will still be, the fire will still be raging. May, may I? Just uh, talk briefly about this because I know we have a lot of other questions. I think there are elements of what both of the, they, them said that uh, make sense. Um, first of all, as Ed said, the exit has to be viable, and, and I think also uh, you know both of them agree on that. That is, you're not going to want to just paper this over without writing down principles substantially. My own view, though, is, and here I disagree with Ed. I don't think that the home prices that he's taking for granted, 
which is, I think, probably derived from the Case-Shiller Index. I, I think that's an exaggerated uh, measure of already where, the, where we are on the downside, and it's also exaggerated in its projections. So there's some technical issues here. There's huge uncertainty about what that home equity shortfall is going to be, and I don't agree with the numbers that he, he quoted. But I would, I would agree, though, uh, also with what Dr. Kling said. We don't want to make this solution in Washington. Um, but I think there are pieces of what Ed said that can be done in a decentralized way. So here, here's the, the answer, basically, in one sentence, according to me. Singling out owner-occupied homes have a government law sharing arrangement that would incentivize privately servicers or owners of mortgages to write down principal and interest quickly if the taxpayer is sharing some of those losses. So they did this in Mexico in 1999. It worked very well because the thing had a timeline. If you want to participate in the loss sharing to mitigate the foreclosures, to avoid the foreclosures, you have to move very quickly. Um, and what you really want to do is, on the margin, push the lenders with a little bit of money to decide to write down rather than foreclose. Because if they foreclose, they are going to lose a lot, too. So you don't have to spend so much. You can get the private sector to spend a lot and let them decide the size of the write down so long as it leads to an, a, a mortgage that is realistic. So that is my view. And I have written about it. And, and if I can supplement that, because my area is design of organizations and programs. Um, once again, if Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were government corporations, they have relations with lenders all over the country. In fact, as we saw in the colloquy between Mr. Issa and, and Dr. Kling, um, not all homeowners are alike. Some deserve one treatment, some deserve another. And it has been suggested that we essentially provide some sort of legal insulation for the servicer of the mortgage and then have a trustee in localities to sit there and work out. And if a homeowner goes to that trustee, they bind themselves whatever decision. And the decision can range from pay or be foreclosed on to you get bankruptcy with cram down features to um, we are going to restructure your mortgage. There could be a range of alternatives. And if I had to think of two institutions that have the connections around the country to administer that kind of program, and, and possibly with, with some of the aspects that Charles Calamiris is talking about, Fannie and Freddie would be it. Before we can go there, we need to take those institutions formally into government hands so they are not all worried about, gee, do we have to satisfy those shareholders? That 20 percent of shareholders that are still there that are going to want value in their company in the future. But they would be the administrative mechanism and they would be the people I would consult with first once they were in government hands. How do we make this work? And I agree with Charles, housing prices are going to still go down, but at some point we can't afford to have 8 million people facing the disruption of their lives in foreclosure, um, there are cheaper ways to do it and, and less costly for people, lenders and the government. Let me say to the gentleman, your time has long expired. <laughs> Let me thank uh, all the witnesses. I really appreciate your coming and, uh, and sharing with us and, of course, uh, um, let me also add that we have uh, seven days for additional comments uh, as well. So thank you very, very much for your testimony. We look forward to working with you in the days and months ahead. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've never seen it get stuck on yellow like that. That was yeah. a first. You, yeah. you were the, you were the ultimate winner of that. Get it repaired. <laughs> it didn't work. 